But that said, we're of course starting with the series Empty Tomb. And uh, before anything else, I just want to say I came back from uh, that a super cluster meeting. A lot of great things happening in our, in our every nation world here in the U.S. Actually, we sense that the harvest is already here. That uh, prophets are been speaking that harvest is really coming, and uh, there's a revival that's going to happen, and we are we need to prepare for that. Pretty much, that's really the, what we have sense coming together, and the uh, charge is prepare the nets. Prepare the nets because the harvest is coming. I don't know about you, but we need to, as, as God's people, to heed that. And, and for the next um, few months, as we come together with the leaders, as I meet with them, actually I'm meeting with the leaders of uh, Pasadena later this evening, and I'll be meeting with the leaders uh, on San Diego next Sunday after our uh, church, and that, that we would hear that once again, and we would sit down and you know process that and how we're going to be able to prepare the net that, you know, because the fish that God promises that we will be fishers of men, amen? That God promises that we will be able to catch them, not, not catch them, be able to hold them as, as God brings them. So that said, also I want to report that uh, our building um, renovation is still ongoing, amen? Yeah. And some of you might be thinking what's going on. It's really the building is still happening, it's still happening. We just had a meeting with some engineers um, uh, last Friday. Uh, there's some things that needs to be fixed as we open up the building that needs to be addressed that needs to be uh, But um, seems like we're gonna be a little bit delayed But uh, just like what I've said I wanted to just fix everything before we move into there so that when we move then we're not gonna fix anything So we're looking at somewhere June July now. So because this fix is quite long uh, I'm sitting there. I'm like is there any way for us to be able not to do that? <laughs> So I'm like, ah. so, but they're trying to finish it. So we have April now, May, it's ongoing now. It's, it's pretty because they're putting the framing there and everything. So, but this is kind of like a, a structural support that we need to put. So it's gonna take some time, some engineering work, some computations, of course, you have to talk to consultants and stuff like that, but it's moving forward, amen. And I just want to take this opportunity. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for giving, you know, in our building campaign and building renovation. Thank you very much. Amen. Let's give everybody a round of applause for this last few months. It's a few more months. Right ago, it was a few more weeks. Now it's about May, June. So, so I just wanted to move there, to be honest. I don't care if you don't have anything. Just stand there like, hey, here's our building. So, but we can't do that. So. We have to fix a lot of things. All right, so empty tomb, and uh, this is now our third week, of course. We're studying the meaning and uh, implication of Jesus' resurrection and how is that affects us, the significance of that in our walk with God. And I, I like this because, again, every Easter Sunday we celebrate, uh, you know, Easter with a great celebration, declaring that Jesus is alive, but somehow after that we stop. And then we don't even talk about the whole ramification of this Easter that we have celebrated. And I think if you look at the book of Acts, even with Jesus' disciple, when he was talking to them in Acts chapter 1, you know, yes, they were excited about Jesus being alive. Yes, they were excited about God really fulfilling what he had promised. But yet there was a discussion in that moment wherein God, are you at this time, according to the disciple, are going to restore the kingdom? Because they understood that Jesus' resurrection is connected to a whole lot of promises that God spoke to them. So this is not just about being happy that Jesus is alive, but what is the implication of that to our future, to our walk with God, and also to our eternal destiny as believers in Christ. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. And I think in the first two weeks, of course, Paul talked about the question because the disciples were asked, sorry, the church in Corinth were asking this. They says, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Because again, because of the, you know, cultural belief, according to the Greeks, that there is no resurrection. Now, Paul was trying to address this. Paul was trying to answer this in a lengthy discussion about answering that really there is this resurrection that we need to be. So in the first two weeks, number one, Paul presented a historical, the first one is historical presentation about Jesus' resurrection, that indeed there is an evidence and proof that he resurrected. 
last Sunday we spoke about that historical but the logical explanation remember that if Christ is not raised from the dead then our faith uh, our faith is futile then we should be pitied most of all and then you know and now we're going to talk about to a little doctrinal discussion in the next two weeks so what is the doctrinal explanation as Paul unfolds this for all of us this is very important the resurrection of Jesus is at the very heart of what we believe as Christians. It affects everything that we believe. And the problem is that most of us doesn't even know the far-reaching doctrinal implication of this. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Amen? So are you ready? So I hope you are. I want everybody please to stand up in reverence to God's word. First Corinthians chapter 15. Just like what we have talked about, we're going to stay in 1 Corinthians 15. Now we're going to start where we left in verse 20 up to verse 28. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. So, sorry, we go also came the resurrection. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the, comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying the, every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is expected to put all things in subjection under him. Join me in the word of prayer. Lord, we ask you to speak to us as even, Lord, as we look at the this catalogical ramification of resurrection and our future eternal destiny. And the good news, as Paul unpacks it, to answer this question, that there is indeed the resurrection. It's because Jesus rose from the grave. Help us. Lord, may it give us hope, not only just to focus on our present situation, but hope and eternal perspective in how we live today. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says a big, big. Amen. Amen. And you can take your seats. You know, during this week, we were having this discussion about guarantees and warranties. I don't know about you, but it's interesting because if you are in the U.S., and again, there are some different warranties and guarantees when you buy things, right? For example, we were having this discussion, you know, in one of the conversations during the pastor's meeting that when you buy things in Costco. So some funny situation where one of the pastors says that this one girl was bringing a dead plant to Costco, and he was falling in line, of course, and he was asking the girl, oh, are you going to return that? And he said, yes, because he could return whenever in Costco. Yeah. But he was looking at this plant that is already withered and it's already dead. And the thing about Costco is that no ask policy is that when you return, you just say, hey, is there anything wrong with that? That's all they're going to ask you. And of course, he was there behind and he was actually, he was dropping because he just can't help because again, it's a dead plant withered to the roots and... And the person returned it, and then, of course, the Costco employee asked the girl and says, is there anything wrong with the plan? <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't know if I could work in Costco. I'm like, if that would have been like, there's something wrong with the plan, right? <laughs> Not the question, if there is something wrong with the plan. And the girl mentioned, says, yeah, I just didn't like it. <laughs> if that would be me, that would be a giveaway. Like, really? You really didn't like this, so. And of course, got the ID, got the whole thing, return, it says he's gonna return which of cash or return to your card. And the girl says, I think it's about, you know, card, return to the card. And I don't know about you, but have you returned something? Don't raise your hands, it's just a rhetorical question, so I don't want to. But I have returned something at Costco, I just wanted to be clear. And again, it's something that, it's still, a tag is still there, everything's in tag is just a wrong size. Because I thought I was medium, but I am not. So, <laughs> so I was trying to fit into one of these shorts that I bought and Jen was like, nah, what size is that? Medium, that's not your size, it's large. 
in this. And of course, I hate returning things, but I have to and go and return the thing and then be that, hey, is there anything wrong with the shirt? And of course, as Filipinos, sometimes you want to explain, right? You should just don't return if you're a Filipino. You have to explain. Yeah, because you know, I was trying the shorts and anything, you know, <laughs> shorts is anything, no, no, nothing is wrong, just wrong size. Card or cash, card, and then just walk. Because I feel like I have to explain, right? And then if you buy something, there's a guarantee, of course, say that with me, guarantee. guarantee. One more time, guarantee. guarantee. And also, there's what you call also warranty. Say that with me, warranty. When you buy something like, you know, a TV, there's a warranty. Bought your car there is a warranty, hundred thousand or whichever comes first, depending on the mileage and stuff like that. But one thing about the U.S. is that that's guarantee and warranty really works. But also sometimes people abuse that. Amen. Yeah, come on, let's be honest. And I've had those several moments wherein this person from Ross was returning something. I was standing there, and it's really the shoes was used. I'm like. The, the, the manager, you know, the, the, the cashier person called the manager because she doesn't want to, you know, accept the return. And because she was like, really, this has already been used. And the girl was also saying, no, I didn't. I just walk in there. And then the cashier person turned the shoes and I, I was there. I was sitting around. <laughs> you know, I, can't help it. I was just there. I was in the line. I was next. So and I'm like, in my mind, it's going to be used. <laughs> because it was really brown. The bar. You didn't just walk in the carpet, you walked somewhere, like in a park, or you went hiking with that shoe. <laughs> so, but again, the policy is that, you know, as long as you can return, so again, right? Amen? But that is interesting because, again, in the Philippines, it's quite different. We have this policy, most of the stores, that no return, no exchange. Hmm. Not in a marriage, it's in the store when you buy things. I'm just, I'm just saying, everything was, you know, quite, you know, we understand things. So when you buy things in the Philippines, because I grew up in the Philippines, is that when you buy things, the moment you pay the cashier, no return, no exchange. You could have bought it two minutes after, or after you paid, you just walk, 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 one, two, and then you realize, I didn't really like this, and then you went back, one, two, I want to return. And then they would point you to the side, no return. But you have seen this, I've not even used this yet. No return. And again, that brings some problem with that. So when it comes to what we're talking about here, we're going to talk about number one is a guarantee, promise, and warranty. And this talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what is that and why is that important for us? The theologians call what Paul was explaining from verse 20 to 28 the eschatological ramification of the resurrection. Eschatological means, you know, the doctrine of last things, death. Judgment, eternal destiny. By the way, look up here. We're all going to die. Amen? It's not if, it's when. We're all going to die. Some of us are going to die earlier than the others. So here's my thing as my wife. As I pray, of course, we want to fulfill what God has called us to do. And that is in the hands of God. But the decision that we make here today are choices. I hope our good choices as we could prolong our life, not to shorten our lives. Amen? And the way we take care of our body. So, judgment, that there's a coming judgment. Amen? Because Jesus promised that he will return and also eternal destinies. Here's what it is. We're all going to live forever. But the only question is where? Is it with Jesus or not with Jesus? So, it's interesting because one of my victory group uh, member and, and that's part of our victory group is that high high skirt control this and here's what he shared and I hope he doesn't mind because he shared it in our victory group here's what he said and of course as a doctor he deals with a lot of patients you know when it comes to people heart condition and also people when their time is already short it's interesting because everybody becomes religious at that particular moment Because there's something about that is deposited in our hearts, something about eternity that echoes in our DNA. Because we know that this is not just when we die here, this is not just the end. You may realize it now or later, 
But you will come to that point when you come face to face with that. So with this, we're going to talk about this now. And this eschatological ramification of the resurrection. And that is what's going to happen in the future now that Christ has risen from the grave. What is the implication of that for you and I as we look forward now to the future of what God has for us? Not just living for this moment, but living for the future. So that we're going to go and I'm going to share to you three things today as we look at this. And here's the first one. First is eschatological ramification is this. Jesus' resurrection guarantees our resurrection. Let's read that. Jesus' resurrection guarantees our resurrection. If there's one guarantee that is sure, better than Costco, is <laughs> the guarantee that Jesus gave for us when he rose from the grave. Jesus' resurrection ensures that also you and I would be resurrected someday. Mm. Amen? Come on. Aren't you glad? Amen. That's a guarantee. While people doesn't know that, that people might be thinking, oh, maybe they will be resurrected. <coughs> but the reality is that this is 100% sure that we will be resurrected also with Him. In verse 20, as you could see, Let's read this, and here's Paul now. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Again, after discussing that if Christ has not risen from the dead, then our faith is futile, then we are more to be pitied or miserable than anyone else, then our faith, then we are what? Well, according to Paul, that then we have misled the people, but now he is what? Now shifting here, the contrast from the negativity with the positive now affirmation of this resurrection. From the logical explanation, if Christ is not really, you know, rose from the grave now, he shifts into this and says that, in fact, that means this is for sure that Christ has been raised from the dead. That means Paul was saying to you and I, you can count on this. You could hold on to this. That's what he was saying. This is not just a fairy tale. This is not just some stories that people have made. In fact, that's what he said. You can count on this. He wanted to establish the fact very clearly that Christ is risen from the dead. Then his preaching is not in vain. Our faith is not in vain. Amen? Because Christ resurrected from the grave. And because what is now his presentation is an evidence. Look at this. According to him, because Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Interesting. And why is that Paul uses the word first fruit, right? And the question is, is the why? What is the meaning of the first fruit? What does it mean? How is it connected to the theological discussion of Paul here? As he encourages of this assurance of the resurrection, the blessing of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now as we look forward to the future, it gives us hope. And what is that? Two things when you look at this. It has, number one, an Old Testament, Old Testament meaning, and also Paul writing to the church in Corinth, being Greeks, is that there's also secular meaning of that. He uses two to explain that Jesus' resurrection guarantees our resurrection. In other words, that first one is in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus. This is what we call the Feast of the First Fruits. After the Passover, which is, you know, uh, the Passover, remember, they're celebrating when they went out of Egypt. After that, the next Sunday, the next week, is that they would go out into the fields, okay, which they hadn't harvested yet in the springtime. So that means they would plant. They haven't had harvested in the field. After that, a week, they would go, and they would go a, take a sheaf. At the very corner of that field, they would take a sheaf. That means a handful of the wheat or whatever that, and they would bring it to the temple. And what is that? That means that is the first fruit. They would gather that, an armload of that, and they would bring it to the temple to offer it to the Lord. Right? Feast of the first fruit. And Paul was saying that the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. What is this? Why is this important? It means that the first evidence of the crop is being presented to the Lord. 
but yet also it guarantees that while I present this as an offering to the Lord, it guarantees that there are many more of the wheat that are coming. So that means Christ being presented to us as the first fruit means he is the first of the many of those people that will be resurrected someday. Ha! Huh. He's the first and many will follow. The only question is that will you part will you be part of those who will follow his resurrection? The first of the many. And also you have to understand while Paul uses the first fruit reaching back to the Old Testament, but also you have to remember he's writing to Greeks in Corinth. The word here also that he uses is the word aparche. A-P-E-R-C-H-E. What does it mean? It means that uh, Greeks use that first fruit as an entrance fee. That's the word. So that means Jesus' resurrection is your entrance fee to your resurrection. That means he gave you the ticket to be resurrected. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? So why is this important? Because imagine if you are serving this Lord that says he's going to be resurrected from the grave and the ramification of that is this coming kingdom and you're not going to be resurrected to the coming kingdom with God. That means that's a very difficult situation that you're going to be in. That's why the disciples in Acts chapter 1, they were asking Jesus, Lord, are you at this time who's going to restore the kingdom? And also the discussion with the disciples in Acts, uh, Mark chapter 10. Remember, uh, 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 James and John approached Jesus and says, Lord, in your glory, uh, I want to be seated at your right hand. Me, my brothers on your right, and the other one is on my left, right? Because they knew that there's life beyond the life today. So everything that you're living for today, actually, is just a drop in the bucket. There's something more in the future for us. But somehow, most of the people just live for today. But yeah, you're not investing into eternity though. Yes, it's expensive in uh, San Diego. Amen? But I love to be in San Diego. We would love to stay in San Diego the best that we can. Amen? But I want you to look up here. But heaven is a lot better place. And here's what it is. You don't have to pay for the sun. Because S-O-N, sun, already paid for your entrance fee. And according to him, he's building a mansion. So that means real estate is secure. Hello. Amen? Amen. And then the presence of God is there every day. What a presence. So that means everything that you're looking for, security, significance, everything paid for God. It might be hard here, but I can't wait for me to be in heaven with God someday. But let me just quantify, not now, in God's time. Amen? I just, I just want to make sure, because again, when you make those kind of statements, God might visit me to them like, hey, you want to go home? So, so, not yet. As long as I finish what God had called me to do. Now, what about the others? Maybe you're asking what been brought to, what, brought back from the dead. I mean, you read that from, you know, Lazarus, when Jesus called him, Lazarus, come out. And also Jairus' daughter, the widow's son, Elijah's moment. Again, if I talk about resurrection, here's what it is. According to one, I forgot if this is uh, John Piper that mentioned this, but let me read this. Our resurrection body is quite different from those who have been resurrected from the dead. Because again, they were resuscitated actually. Because Lazarus also died again. Amen? Jairus' daughter died again. So what Paul was saying is that this is a resurrection body is quite different because it's a body fit for eternity. To be honest with you, I don't know how we're going to look like, but we have an idea of how it is because Jesus resurrected from the grave. That is the resurrection body that we're going to have. We have several clues. That means one of the meeting, Jesus was what? Wanted to meet with his disciples. The door were closed. He walked right into the door. That means that's your resurrection body. This is an example of what you'll be able to do with that body that's fit for eternity. You'll be able to walk on doors. 
but also he was meeting with his disciples, he was eating fish. That means you could eat, you eat as well. But then the Bible says that it's going to be new. So that means you could eat whatever you want. You may not grow. <laughs> what a moment. I can't wait. But I could eat all the sissy gold that it's on. <laughs> and it's not going to reflect on... I don't know if there's sissy gold that I'm just, I'm just dreaming here, okay? But Jesus was eating fish with his disciples, so might be there's some food involved, right? So, but yet, it's not going to reflect on your annual physical exam. <laughs> which is a dreaded moment for me. A body fit for eternity. So let me ask you this. Are you thinking about eternity? Or just living for now? A lot of people just live for now. That's why they don't make the right decision that prepares them for eternity. Their motto in life is live now, die now. Live and let die. Hmm. And here's another one that Paul says in verse 21. For as by a man came death. He's talking about Adam. You know, in some translation, it was Adam that was put there. By a man has come also what? The resurrection of the dead. So verse 22, for us in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Interesting about this because again, there's another doctrine and, uh, and, and here's what it is. And it's because of what Adam did, because he represented humankind, mankind, when he disobeyed God, it affected all of us. The sin that we're experiencing right now, the death that comes with sin, is because of Adam and Eve. And specifically for Adam, because he was the one giving mandate to lead. Amen? But of course, he abdicated that. You could read that in Genesis chapter 3. All the curses that have come because of sin. The relationship with God is broken. The relationship with uh, man and woman is restrained. The relationship of man to earth was what? Restrained. I mean, affected as well. The ground was cursed. There's so many curses there. But yet in the middle of all of those, God spoke that, you know, he's going to restore everything back again. Even in the book of Genesis, yes, thousands of years since before Jesus Christ fulfilled all of those, but God already spoke that promise. And here's what we're talking about here, because of Jesus Christ, okay? So also in Christ shall all be made alive. I like that. Made alive in Christ. No more experiencing death, amen? No more experiencing the power of sin, because we're all gonna live again someday. Because Jesus' resurrection guarantees our resurrection. That is one guarantee that you could count on, stand on, put your hands on, because that's a promise that is sure. And look at this in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, as Paul repeats this. For us, by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Amen? Come on, everybody says amen. amen. Say this with me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. One man, obedience. We are made righteous because of what he has done. Number two, Jesus' resurrection promises that believers, believers will rise again when he returns. I love this. This is the second thing that I love about this. But look at this. But each... Uh, in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Let's pause there. That means Jesus' resurrection promised that the believers will rise again when he returns. Let me say this to you today. I don't know when. I don't know when it's going to happen. But the, prop, the scripture says that Christ will return someday. Do you ask me, if you're going to ask me what's the date, when it's going to be? I don't know. Because the Bible says no one knows. That's why when you hear preachers that says, you know, that they know when Jesus Christ is coming, you better run away. Because no one knows, the Bible says. But here's what I know. He's coming. But he's coming for those, look at this, the second coming is for those who belong to Christ. I want you to pause for a moment and reflect on that. Christ is coming. He could be coming later this evening, tomorrow morning, a week from now, a year from now. To be honest, I don't know. But it's coming for those who belong to him. My question to you is that, do you belong to Christ? 
There, Paul was clear. Those who belong to Christ. Do you belong to Jesus? If he's coming, he's coming to take us back with him. If you don't belong to him, he's coming for a different reason. But he's coming. It's like, you know, when you're assigned to take to watch over the house, like your parents, you know, leave sort of vacation. Hey, and if you know, if you did right by following your parents' instructions, you're excited that they're returning, right? Yeah. I have done that, you know, hey, we're going, and then, you know, you're in charge for two days, and then like, you followed all the instructions, so you're like, yes, I wanna show my mom that I'm ready, you know, just follow everything. And also, if you didn't do what your mom says, you're excited? No, most probably not. You're nervous that your mom is coming back home. And here's what I like about my parents leaving when my mom says, I'll be back in two days. At least I have, you know, some space to know. <laughs> but when my mom says, I don't know, maybe two, three days, quite difficult. Quite difficult to do anything because you don't. But now you can track them on the phone. So, sorry, I'm, I might give you some points. My daughter does that. She tracks us. So next time I'm going to go put my phone because, yeah, Sean is sitting there. So. so let me just say this. Christ will resurrect Christians when he comes. According to what we're reading. So when will it, all this happen? Just like what I've said, I don't know. And according to this, here's the order. There's an order here in how it's going to work. First, Christ, the first fruit, remember? First fruit, that means he's the first of the many. And then, at his coming, those who belong to him. Let me ask you this. The order first is Christ. Did that already happen? Come on, this is a simple question. Let's read. Uh, Christ, the first fruit. Did that already happen? So that means we're now in the second order. So that means it's coming anytime. My question to you is this, are you prepared when he comes? Yes. I hope so. Because again, if you're not, then this is the time for you to be sure. There's a lot more that we could talk about this, post trip, pre trip, but we're not gonna go through that. I'm just giving you the basic for now because it's gonna go create a whole lot of questions instead of you being clarified. But the main thing here, he's coming back again. And here's the next question. Are you prepared when he comes back? What would you do? What would you say to him when he returns tonight? You're like, no, no, I'm not ready. Oh, don't, no, 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 repent just to make sure. Or are you excited? It's because finally you're going to be able to see the one who died for you, who gave his life to you. And you're excited because you know that you're going with him. I don't know about you, but my, my mom is going somewhere. I mean, I was young. I want to go with my mom. Because I don't know where we're going, but if I'm with my mom, I know I'm going to get fed. <laughs> there's some food if there's a long trip I know I'm going to get fed so it doesn't matter so as long as I'm with my mom I'm going to get fed and I know I'm going to be taken care of right come on when you're young right this one all the kids you're going to have kids someday they're all going I know I'm going to go and they will cry because of that attachment yes but most of that because they're more secure when they are with you I don't know about you but same with Christ I just want to be where Christ is and he returns like, take me, take me. I'm done here, too expensive in San Diego. <laughs> take me, free rent in heaven, amen. And not only that, I'm not going better call, better than everything. Look at First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. And again, this is the best. You talk about rapture and eschatology. This is one of the verses that a lot of pastors and theologians use. And look at this in four, verse 16. This is the Apostle Paul. Paul, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. Ladies and gentlemen, he's going to return, and everybody knows when he returns. It's not like Jesus arrived and like, you know, what happened in, 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 in Bethlehem. Some people knew, some people don't. But this time, everybody would know. Why? There's an announcement. The trumpet. I don't know how it's going to sound. I don't know. But it's going to be. I don't know. Sounds, sounds bad as a call. <laughs> so, what would be a perfect trump, trumpet call? Oh. Look at that. It's, it's not, it's, it's a trumpet. So, and then the dead in Christ will rise. Are you reading what I'm reading? So everybody that have died will rise. You won't miss this. Because in some of the houses where you're staying, might be a burial ground, so. <laughs> so but you will not miss. Millions, millions of people. Caveat is those who belong to him first. There's the second round, but those who doesn't belong to him, but those who belong to him first. So when this happens, and you, and everybody's, how would you know if you're dead? So, anyway, moving forward. And here's, let's continue. And then after that, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Wow. The dead will rise first. And if you're alive when Jesus returns, then you. So that means you and together with others that are dead will be caught up in the air. So we will see each other. At that moment, we will know who's really a Christian or not. Wow. <laughs> Actually, that's what it is. And then he'll be looking. Pen? Pen? <laughs> Pastor Robert? <laughs> Joshua? Uh -huh. Actually, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Them first, and then us. And everybody you thought will be, you know, that are Christians, that's the moment that we will know. But the decision for you to get there is here right now. You can't make that when everybody was being raptured and you're like, Lord, I accept you, my heart, and Jesus. <laughs> Too late. For those who belong to him. Amen? Wow. I don't know about you. This is the most scariest moment of your life or the most glorious moment of your life. At that particular moment, if that you belong to Christ, you're being raptured, you're like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> the guarantee is resurrection. It's never about you. I can't wait for that moment. And while also that happens, the next one will be, the unbelievers will be as well, but there will be a judgment. There will be a celebration. There's also going to be a lot of weeping. Ha. Huh. All will be resurrected, but not all will receive the resurrection of life. Some will receive the resurrection of condemnation. They were judged is because they didn't make a decision to follow Jesus. And they would live forever, not with Jesus, but in hell. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, hell is true. Number three, Jesus' resurrection brings final resolution to everything. I'm going to stop in verse 25 because the 26 to 28, I'm going to use that on week four. Because we're going to talk about death being defeated. But let me just, enough for us to talk about here. Jesus' resurrection brings final resolution to everything. What do you mean? Look at this. Then comes the end. After all of that, then the end is going to come. Hmm. End will come, ladies and gentlemen, when he delivers the kingdom to God and the Father after destroying what? Every rule and every authority and every power. Jesus has the power and the ability to destroy, according to the text that we're reading, what? Destroy every rule, every what? Authority and every power. The only question is, are you part of that group that God is going to destroy? Hmm. 
For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So this is quite a beautiful eschatological ramification. That means, look at here. Theologians call he called this as already and uh, already but not yet. That means we have received the victory because of what Christ has done at the cross, but not yet because the full completion is that when he comes and when he returns. Why do I say already? Because God already defeated death, but still we're gonna die, but yet already but not yet not yet is because again we're going to be resurrected with Christ so that means we have an eternity to plan for the only question is that are you ready for being with Jesus or not being with Jesus and also here's another good news for this is that what we experience here today is just temporary amen loved ones that that died and passed away you know, things maybe that you've been wrong, there's injustice, everything will be put in place in the future. That means, that's why Jesus says, vengeance is mine. If you have been wrong in this lifetime, guess what? Everything will be made right when Jesus Christ destroys every rule, every authority, and every power. So that means I have hope. Some people may say that they have gotten away by doing things, you know, doing the wrong things. But actually, you didn't get away. You are just being given a time to repent. Because when he returns, no more repentance. Because that's the end. So God being gracious to us, with everything that is going on around us, give us time to make things right before him. And the question is, will you take that opportunity for you to hold on to make things right before him? Because one day, it will never be, there will never be a chance to do that again. Jesus' resurrection signifies the culmination and fulfillment of God's plan for redemption and restoration. God is going to restore, God is going to redeem. In the same, it, it is the ultimate resolution to all brokenness, to all pain, to all suffering in the world. Through his resurrection, Jesus conquered sin, death, defeated death, and paved the way for the renewal of all creation. The Bible says there are going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Amen? Aren't you excited for that? In a body fit for eternity. Amen. He will bring everything under his power and authority. And let me say this again as I end. Nothing will ever be broken again once you return. No more broken earth. Nothing. He will restore everything as He created it to be. And let me end with this in Revelation chapter 2, verse 21, rather. Verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Wow. That's the ending. God will dwell with us once more. And it never ends there. And look at this. It's one of the most beautiful texts. And as you read the book of Revelation, this is the ending in verse at chapter 21. Here's what it says. For he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning. No more crying. Nor pain anyone. Anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated to the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And what's the evidence? God already gave you the first fruit. Which is what? Jesus' resurrection. That is your entrance fee. The only question is that, will you take that ticket for you to be included in that resurrection when everything is made with it? Join me in the word of prayer. Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you for encouraging us. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for reminding us, God. I want to give you this opportunity today. And if you're here today for the first time, if you have never given your life to Jesus, surrendered your life to Jesus, this is the moment. 
Because this is the time when you think about eternity, not just for the present. That means when he returns, will he return for you? And if you're not sure, I'm giving you this opportunity today to surrender your life to Jesus and say, God, I'm giving my life to you today. I'm surrendering my life to you. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hands and let me pray for you. Anyone in this room, you're giving your life to Jesus. Surrendering your life to him and saying, I want to make sure. Thank you, Lord. Thank you because you love us. Thank you, Lord, that even looking at this eschatological ramification, Lord, it teaches us, God, to have, Lord, our eyes fixed on eternity as well. Thank you for the promise. Thank you for the guarantee. Let's bow down and ask us if you're here also. Maybe you're going through some situations that you don't understand. Challenges. There's hope in Jesus. Because there's a, an evidence because of what he has done. You're saying, God, I'm putting my hope in you. My hope in you. Maybe a situation for your family, a situation in your marriage, a situation in your workplace. Say, God, you know what you're doing. You hold the future in your hand. And I trust that. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hands and let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Yes. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are lifting up their hands. Challenges, difficulties, uncertainties. Lord, you're already given us the evidence, Lord, that the most difficult promise you fulfilled. And the promise and the guarantee is this. That, Lord, because of what you've done, you could and you are in control of our situation. And with that, we trust. And with that, we hold on. But we commit everything to you, Lord. And we're grateful. We lay it down at your feet. Thank you, Jesus. Put down your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says, Amen. 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 Come on, let's give Elijah.